Okay, we are back. Sorry, there hasn't been much this month. I've had a hell of a time in the last few weeks. Moving right on into the questions. As before, this is primarily a Q&A session for the Patreon donors, but every now and then I'll take a good question from the comments section of other videos, and lucky mistake has posed one of those. What is the difference between an M4A376 with HVSS and an M4A3E8? Excellent question, and thank you for asking, as this is the sort of thing which annoys the hell out of me. If you are one of those who uses the two terms interchangeably, yes, you are wrong. But on the other hand, you are also in good company. There are plenty of documents from end users in the field who use the term interchangeably as well. It doesn't make them any more correct, but it is a significant cause of much of the problem. Generally speaking, it seems that many people will use the term Easy 8 to any Sherman which has a 76mm gun and the horizontal value suspension system. Many will use it for any tank which is either of these two features, but most reserve it for the combination of the two. And here's the problem. This is an Easy 8. As are these. Here's an Easy 6. So it's time for a nomenclature lesson, and we'll use the long name for the basis of this. The M designates a model, M1, M2, and so on. It's the base type of tank, such as Stuart, Lee, Sherman, Pershing, etc. An E suffix designates an experimental subversion, which has not necessarily been approved for production. E for experimental. Simple enough. If an experimental subversion is approved for production, it becomes an A suffix. The A meaning approved variant. Maybe it's something else, but that's good enough. So there's the M4, which is the welded M4 with the radial engine, the M4A1, which is the cast version with the radial, M4A2 with the twin diesel, M4A3 with the Ford A5, which is the Grizzly, and A6, which was a big cat engine. So far, so good. Next comes the caliber of the gun in brackets. The default was 75mm, but when the 76 started coming out, the 75 might be specified as well. After the caliber will be a W if the vehicle was equipped with wet stowage. As all 76s came with wet stowage, the W is often discarded as redundant after 76. Right, now it starts getting complicated. It is possible to make experimental subvariants of the variants. So if you tweak an M4A3 with an experimental feature, you might end up with the M4A3E1, which actually ended up being an M4A3 with an automatic transmission. If approved, the automatic transmission vehicle could be either the M4A3A1 or the M4A3B1 or more likely something like the M4A7. There seems to have been very little rationality behind the assignment of the E numbers. Sometimes an upgrade would just take an available E number of a variant, such as the MDAP Shermans being either an M4A1E6 or an M4A3E4, despite basically being the same upgrade. Whilst the M4A2E4 was the torsion bar Sherman. On the other hand, when the M4E8 designation was selected for a new type of suspension system, someone decided that E8 may as well be the experimental version of every variant with this new suspension. So here's the most important bit. The E8 refers only to the suspension system, nothing else. Not the hull shape, not the gun, not anything else, only the running gear with a HVSS twin wheel pair bogies and a center guide track. The E designation for the 76mm gun, which also came with a simplified hull shape and wet stowage while they were at it, was the EZ6. Which now brings us to the next misconception. It is often claimed that the EZ8 was so named because of the smooth ride, and the truth is a bit less interesting. In World War II, the alphabets were different. Today we say Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta Echo. The tank would be the Mike 4 Alpha 3 Echo 8. In 1944, though, one would say Mike 4 Able 3 Easy 8. For whatever reason, the term E8 made it to the field, since the tank was not given an additional A variation, and it's a lot easier to type E8 than with HVSS, which probably led to its widespread adoption and use. Now here's the next tweak. Pretty much all US Army deliveries with HVSS suspensions for A3s. Other nations had to make do with whatever was left over, which basically meant the diesel-powered A2. 
A well-known example of this is Fury. The tank is powered by the twin diesel, making it an M4A276HVSS, but it portrays an American M4A3. Since under a thousand M4A3s were built with a 75mm gun and HVSS, the default for HVSS medium tank was with a 76mm, and so nobody normally felt the need to specify it. If they specified the suspension, it was basically enough. If it had a 105mm gun, then it was an assault gun, not a medium tank, and the 105mm was specified. So there you go, the full title, M4A376 with HVSS, is the correct name as it specifies all the relevant features. Type of tank, type of engine, type of gun, and type of suspension. M4A3E8 was the name of the experimental variant, which was good enough for most purposes, and so was used in the field. Tim Pullman wants to know if the M3 medium was basically the first tank with a quick detachable transmission. And that's actually a damn good question, and I would submit that the answer is really rather relative. The M3 and M4 of course have that large transmission housing at the front, which can simply be bolted off for removal. Basically everything that you need to reach in order to get a transmission to disconnect it is easy to get at, and doesn't take long to swing the assembly out of the way. That's not to say that it was particularly difficult to get at other transmissions though. Look at the pre-war Panzer IV for example. There is a large hatch front center, just remove the hatch, disconnect the parts and the transmission comes right out the hatch for replacement. It might be a little bit more fiddly and I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps a few more fingers might have been lost due to tight clearances, but generally speaking there seems to be very little impractical about it. You will see similar hatches on the pre-war Panzer I or 38T for example. Tanks such as Panzer III or Tiger, which required basically disassembling the vehicle in order to change out the transmission, seem to have been more the exception than the standard, even in the first part of the war. So whilst the Americans certainly took the whole easy to repair thing to the max, particularly with the M18, in which both the engine and the transmission could slide out on rails, it would not be fair to say that earlier tanks were not designed with some accommodation for transmission and repair in mind. On a related note, Commissar Carl also asks what the Panzer IV's reliability was, especially later in the war. He asks because of the theory that the Germans should have just stuck with the Panzer IV because they generally worked compared to the Panthers. Now, I personally don't think that would have been a great solution because the Panzer IV, fantastic a tank though it is, and I truly believe it was one of the best tank designs ever, was still fundamentally a pre-war design stretched beyond its limits, and the Germans could never produce enough of them to match the numbers of Shermans and T-34s, which were both quantitatively and qualitatively superior to the Panzer IV. I've asked Hilary Doyle, haven't gotten an answer back, I'll let you know if he does. Adam C wants to know my thoughts on Master Milo's Type 69 rebuild. For those of you who don't know, it's a couple of Dutchmen who bought a former Iraqi army tank from the UK a few months ago and have been video blogging the restoration process. An interesting feature has the old T-34 style track pins which get hammered back into place by the ramp welded to the hull if they're sticking out too far. I've also seen it on a T-62, so the idea hung around for quite a while, even though most T-55s and 62s had bolts to hold the track pins in. As for the restoration, it seems to be more time money intensive than difficult. The tank started out fairly much intact, with really the significant problems being the rusting away of the sheet metals due to the tank sitting unprotected in the open for a quarter century. Fortunately for them, the T-55 is a pretty basic design, which is easy to understand. That said, of course, they are certainly doing something I can't, so all credit to them. They seem to be on the downhill stretch right now, so more power to them. Admiral Tiberius wants my opinion on what made the upgraded Israeli Shermans so effective. Was it the gun, the tactics, or the crews? Almost without reservation, I'm going to go with the crews. For all the awesomeness of the big 75 or the 105 guns, fundamentally we're still talking about a World War II tank with World War II armor designed for a 76mm gun being used two or three decades later, and that's going to have an effect on the vehicle. The upgrade certainly kept Shermans within shouting distance, but realistically a T-55 versus an M-50 should go in the T-55's direction every time. If they hadn't gotten the upgrades, they would not have been viable. But viable versus beating the pants off of the opposition 
comes down to the crews and the other forces around them. Robert Henry Ulston, how much control does an individual tank commander have over the ammunition loadout for the main gun? I certainly wasn't given a choice. However, from what I've gathered from the archives, ammunition supply seems to have been decided upon at a much higher level, and we're talking division or even army level. After all, they're the guys ordering the ammunition to be delivered across the water. That said, that's a reflection of expenditure, not consist, and I would think the company commanders at least likely had a fair bit of input. This is, however, personal speculation. Bill Hollowell wants to know if the 6.3 million US dollar unit cost, which the Aussies paid for refurbished M1s, was as good a buy compared to an M1A2 for which the US pays about the same price. Now there are one or two changes that the Aussies made over the standard M1A1. For example, their tanks apparently come with a refrigerator. Not that this likely cost a quarter million dollars, I hope, but still. Also, for political reasons, they didn't get the DU armor, instead getting some other package, which doubtless was a lot more complicated and expensive to get similar levels of protection. The big factors, though, are going to be order size and supporting contract terms. For example, if the contract for 60-odd vehicles included simulators, one can imagine that the tank-to-simulator ratio is probably lower for the Aussies than the Americans, and the unit cost thus higher. And that's certainly part of it. The level of support for anything from the number of spare road wheels that came with the tanks through personnel assigned as advisors, if any, will affect the price of a military contract. So if the Aussies got a good deal for their money or not, I can't tell you. Vitold Yukowski. Have the Russians acquired any current service Western MBTs and tested them? To my knowledge, no. The few times M1s have been captured, the US has generally gone out of its way to blow them up. I am unaware of anything more recent than an M60 finding their way to the Russians for testing, but then again I strongly doubt that they would advertise. Kazuki K, yet again, two questions. One, I had mentioned that the seals around the hatches in the M1 were terrible at keeping the water out of the inside, and is this a problem for the electronics? No, not the electronics, just for you. The seals, when they are new and intact, well, they actually work fine. The problem is that they get battered around by careless crews standing on them, tripping over them, whatever, and are usually not a high priority for repair. So when you drive through a pond, you end up with a waterfall on your lap. Two, how exactly does the T-72's carousel autoloader stay aligned with the gun during turret traverse? I have absolutely no idea, and next time I'm in a T-72 I'll see if I can find a locking pin or some such. An interesting question from Spencer Loper. Given that I have led the charge on rehabilitating the internet's collective stance on the M4, what have been my observations since then? Well, I don't know if I've actually led the charge per se, I think that honour goes to Steve Zaloga. Uh, I have had to deal with the deniers and veraboos, but there have also been some pretty rational folks who accuse me of overcompensating. I'm not going to say they're entirely wrong. It is possible to listen or read my work and conclude that I am advocating that the tank was the ultimate in design. It wasn't, but it was still damn good for what the US needed, and certainly it was good enough. The biggest problem with it was that it was limited by the development work which preceded the US's entry into the war. For example, Gladion Barnes, the mad scientist over at Ordnance R&D, held a patent for a torsion bar tank suspension which he registered in 1934. However, the funding for it just wasn't there, and volume bogies were good enough and far cheaper. It would have been interesting to speculate what the M4 could have looked like had the US Army been properly funded ahead of time. However, what-ifs like that are kind of pointless. It is true that I don't often dwell on the tank's liabilities. See for example the video of Why the Poor Reputation over on Military History Visualized channels. Or is it not visualized? It's one of those two. However, the liabilities are usually well covered by other folks anyway. Charles Charange. As a former TC, how hard would running a platoon in 1940 have been compared to today? That will depend on a couple of factors. One, 
Is it a three-man turret crew, or am I trying to command a platoon at the same time as I'm loading the cannon? Two, how good is the radio system? If I were, for example, a platoon leader of a Panzer III platoon in 1940, I really don't think there'd been a huge difference to today. One obviously would have had to pay a little bit more attention to the terrain in order to keep track of where you were, since there was no GPS, and the gunner likely might have had to, had to have a little bit more help acquiring targets, but the problems of information and task overload would have basically been the same then as now. You're figuring out where you are, where your tanks are, where your friends are, where the enemy is, and what to do about all of them, whilst also talking to higher, lower, and counterparts, and that's before you get actually going through the target engagement process in your tank. It is an incredible shock to the system the first time you try doing all of this, and I'm sure it was no less a shock today than it was in 1940. Reagan Thomas Slatter. What type of recovery vehicles did America use during World War II? The US's main tank recovery vehicles were the M31 series, based on the M3 medium, and the M32 series, based on the M4 medium. In total, about 2,600 of these were built between the two types. Now, consider putting that into some perspective. The US built about a third as many tank recovery vehicles as the Germans built Panthers, and a lot more than they built Tigers and Tiger II. In theory, vehicles such as the M26A1 tractor, the Dragon Wagon, were armoured and could recover vehicles as well, but I suspect it was more in theory than in practice. G for George, seems like a very RAF type name, had a related question about the general development of ARVs, along the lines of when it was that folks figured out that a recovery vehicle needed to be as mobile as the vehicle it was recovering. My guess, World War I. After all, tanks never break down where the going is easy, not just because fate is cruel, but also because that's what's more likely to cause trouble in the first place to get it stuck. It probably didn't take very many times of a vehicle getting stuck before somebody figured out that a recovery vehicle needed to at least get as far as a victim tank did before it got stuck. A couple of chaps wanted to know how you get an injured crewman out of a tank. Well, it's out the top in most tanks, unless you're in a Merkava, in which case you have it easy. This normally requires one or two folks pushing from below, while one or two pull from up top, which sort of sucks if you have a spine injury. So for demonstrational purposes, I have dragged out one of my old tanker suits. So as I get to the front, okay, collar front, as I open it up, you see this white thing in here? This is a handle, and there is a reinforcing strap which comes down under the armpits. So if you're trying to drag somebody out the hatch, you reach down inside the collar, grab the handle, and you basically can haul him up, lifted from the armpits. You don't have to kind of drag his arms and stretch his arms or anything else like that. Now, when I was in Canada working with the Ontario Regiment Museum, I was uh, able to notice that their tanker suits, the handles are actually on the outside. But it's basically a similar principle. I think I prefer the inside version, uh, mainly because if it's on the inside, it's much less likely to snag on things as you're getting in and out of the tank. But uh, anyway, there you go. That's your, your grab handles. So that is it for this month's q and I've got a few interesting plans coming up over the next few weeks, which should make up for this month's relative quiet. And so until then, take care.